Sunday, the week before Easter, and the Messiah is heading into Jerusalem, and they're laying down the palms because it's a messianic prophecy that he would come in on a, on a colt, um, and their king would come to them in peace, and they were laying down palms. And so he's making this triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and we know that just a week later that uh, he gave up his life, uh, eventually was crucified and was buried, and he rose again. Uh, that's what we're celebrating next weekend. So uh, uh, today's been kind of a cool day to commemorate that. Um, my name's Ed. If you have been around New Life and you know that, um, I have a wife named Tammy. And so if you're new or a guest today, uh, my wife Tammy's sitting in the back with two really pretty kids. Uh, those, those, she made those. Uh, and uh, so we've been married like 17 years almost. And I want to share just a couple things about me before I kind of get into the, the talk today from the Bible. Um, I'm going to be 44. So here's the thing. It, it goes really fast. Like, you don't think in your mind, oh, I'm going to be 44. It just kind of happens, sneaks up on you, and then you think, wow, I'm, I'm middle-aged, man. I mean, I hope so. Like, 44. But here's what I was thinking about. Every generation has an iconic figure or an iconic picture or something that you're going to see that you, everyone who's in that generation knows exactly what it is. So when you see the picture, like my dad's generation, it was a picture of like little JFK Jr. saluting his father as his casket was going by. Like everyone who sees that picture knows exactly what happened. They know how they felt when they heard about it. I mean, it's just that little picture. You know, and in later generation, Neil Armstrong getting down. The words he spoke. Like everyone sees that picture. They know exactly what happened. I would think in your generation, it would be the towers, right? You don't have to say what it is. You don't have to know. You just you see the picture that you know exactly what happened on that day. And it's affected everybody since, right? Well, in my generation, there's an iconic figure that I only see pictures up until this past week. Uh, but there's actual video of the event. It happened on June 5th, 1989. And what happened was it was this... That this uprising happened in China. At the time, the government was really oppressing these people, and there were a bunch of students kind of leading a revolution, protest, basically rise up saying, you, you know, they want rights, they want to have freedom of speech. Things that you and I take for granted was happening right in China. And here's what happened right after that, in the middle of this protest, people are losing their lives. And this picture, every person from my generation knows exactly what. 19 years old, can you imagine? You may be here, somebody at your guest, uh, somebody getting baptized today, or maybe this is your first day ever in a church. Maybe you've been following Jesus since you were born. And I realize that two people like that can have extreme views on how they see God in the world, but I think everyone agrees that when you see someone who's willing to stand up for something that they believe in, we all admire that person. Someone's willing to take a stand to live a life to make a difference. We all admire that type of person. We can agree. We've been going through a series at New Life, and New Life is a church. We've been on campus, have been for the last 10 years or so, and you know, we meet every Sunday in the Women's Field House just down the road here, and it's an awesome time. I want to thank you guys for making the trek to come over here in the middle of the afternoon, and I realize a lot of people couldn't come with you, but it means a lot make the trek over here and, and the people from Neal Avenue allow us to use their building to do the baptism. So I mean it's super nice of them to do that. But we've been going through this series this past semester talking about the idea of thinking bigger and living bigger. That if, if our minds can conceive who God really is then we might live a life worthy of who God is. If we can start to understand and, and get the concept in our heart what God is and who He is and who Jesus is and His Holy Spirit, then we might start to live it out and live a very big life. And so I was thinking, as I was preparing for this message, what would it look like? What would God want us to do? What kind of stand would He want us to make? And sure enough, there's a passage of Scripture that actually tells us verbatim exactly what kind of stand you and I are expected to make as followers of Jesus. So I'm going to ask you to turn to 1 Corinthians 15. I'm going to share a little bit. And uh, before I get there, I'm just going to pray for us that God will speak to us in this time, okay? So pray along with me. God, I, I ask that somehow, some way, that we would understand you a little bit better for having been here today. That you would use this scripture, that you would use the testimonies, that you would use the words of the Psalms to help us understand something about who you are 
And I pray that you would teach us how you want us to make a stand in our lives. In Jesus' holy name, amen. This passage in 1 Corinthians 15, let me kind of give you some breakdown. All right, Palm Sunday, Jesus goes into Jerusalem. He's got his gang of guys, whether they call them disciples. And he's got some family with him. They're going into Jerusalem. And then you know what happened? He lost his life. It was the plan from the start. He dies on the cross, pays a penalty for our sins, and then three days later he rises again. Then he shows up, starts meeting with his guys first, the ones who were scared to death and running. He shows up to them. He shows up to some family members. He shows up to a bunch of people, and then he shows up to Paul, a guy who was actually a Pharisee, who was an enemy of Jesus. This guy, Paul, literally was out trying to kill Christians. And what happened was Jesus appeared to him, and that changed the trajectory of his entire life. He actually went from town to town proclaiming this risen Christ and a message about Christ and planted churches. And what happened is this, this book, 1 Corinthians 15, is a letter written to one of those churches where Paul is trying to encourage them, he's going to correct them, and he's going to challenge them all at the same time in this letter. Now, what's interesting about this church is that it was a young church, and the letter was written about 20 years after Jesus had risen. So really, within the first generation, just a couple of decades into this movement called Christianity, Here's Paul writing this letter. Here's what he says in, in 15, verse 1. He says, Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. So, listen, if you've ever learned, okay, what kind of stand am I going to make? If I'm going to make a stand in life, a big stand, or live a big life, if I'm going to stand up, even when no one else is around, what am I going to make my stand on? The gospel. All right? So we'll get to that in a second. By this gospel you've been saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you believe in vain. Listen, salvation comes through the gospel. No other place. There's no other name you can rely on. You can't rely on your name, your ability to do really great things. Not going to happen. There's only one name you can rely on. That's Jesus. That's the gospel. For what I received, I pass on to you as of first importance. First importance. That's important to you. Let me explain why. Because there's a lot of things that the movement called Christianity might be known for. The Red Cross. Caring people, good people, rule keepers, people with good conduct, sometimes hypocrites, people who maybe do social justice. Those, in some cases, are all really good things. You, you want to be the kind of person that represents Christ well. And you want to be able to give your life to something that's important, right? What God says is of first importance is the gospel. What God says is of first importance is the gospel. What is the gospel? That Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. That he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And now listen, if you're like me and you've been a Christian for a long time, you've heard those words again and again. Let me just explain. Think about it. What's the last thing you really processed in your mind and in your heart? God made you to be in a relationship with him. That was the plan. It started way back with Adam and Eve. They made some mistakes, and you and I make mistakes. And what happens is, because we're supposed to be in this relationship, God is really holy and perfect, and we're really not. Okay? And so what happens is, because we're not, we have unholiness or sin in our life. So heaven's perfect. Heaven's great. God wants us to be within. But what happens if he lets unholy, imperfect people into a very perfect place? What would happen to that very, very perfect place? We have a problem, right? Maybe you're saying, okay, Ed, here's what I'm going to do. Today, from this day forward, I'm hearing you. Palm Sunday, you know, 2014, I'm going to be perfect from this point forward. Well, if you can pull it off, amazing, because you're a great person. I mean, that's incredible. But here's the thing. What are you going to do with the past stuff? What would you do with your past sin? Because you're still trying to drag that into a perfect place, and it won't be perfect anymore. So the question is, can you fix it? Probably not. So God sends his son down here to live a perfect life, to die on a cross, to pay for all of our sins. All of the justice of God is poured out on the cross one time. That's the gospel, that he was rose again, and he now is alive and calling us into a relationship. You and I can be right with God or made righteous. That's like a religious word for made right. Imagine like, um, imagine like you and your best friend are fighting. And he goes, come to me, like, we're not talking to each other. I mean, please tell them they're wrong. And, and I kind of intervene here, and like, listen, okay, what happened? Like, you, you tell me what it did, you tell me what I did. They're like, listen, you need to say sorry, and you need to say sorry. I'll be like, working out. I'm an intermediary. I kind of work on your behalf, both of you to kind of reconcile you together. Got it? You were in a situation like that? 
maybe, you know, I'm, it happens to be like every day in my own house as I do little girl. So, I mean, it happens all the time. Before you're not reconciled and then you become reconciled. That's what Jesus did. He made a way for us to be reconciled to the Father. That is incredible news. That's the gospel. That is of first importance. That is where Jesus took his stand against sin. This is what I love about the Bible. It's the next few verses blow my mind. Remember, this is written literally 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead. I don't know if you guys read your Bible on a regular basis, but let me tell you something. This next little section you should memorize. Here's the deal. Paul is telling him, listen, this is the most important thing. Jesus rose from the dead. And then he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve, and then after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of them are still living, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, that's the brother of Jesus, then to the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also as one that had born. Why is that important? Because he's basically saying, listen, you know, go ask him. You know Bill, right? Bill was there. He saw the risen Jesus. Go ask him. He's not writing this 100 years later. He's writing this in the same generation saying, yeah, you know why this thing is moving along? People are believing it because there are people who saw the risen Jesus. Go ask them yourself. The next little section, and it goes on during the chapter, and he talks about the resurrection, the importance of the resurrection, how Jesus is alive. And we can put our hope in him. And then at the end, of the, the end of the chapter, here's what he says. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Stand firm. And let nothing move you. Make your stand. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. What does that mean? He's basically saying, I want you to take a stand on the most important thing. And that is the gospel. I want your life to count for the gospel. Devote yourself fully to the work of the Lord. You know what the work of the Lord is? The gospel. That people would understand the gospel. That they'd be reconciled to the Father. That's what he expects from every person who considers themselves a Christian or a Christ follower. That's what it means to take a stand. The question is, what if you were the only one, like Tank Man? I have some friends that have Many of you guys know my friends, Jesse and Faith Beckett. Uh, they used to be part of New Life for a while, and now they live in Mexico. They uh, help run an orphanage down there, and we just sent a whole team of people down there, so many of you guys get to meet them maybe for the first time. Some of you guys are re, you know, get reacquainted with them. But just this incredible uh, couple who live their lives out so the gospel will be spread into the students' lives and the young people's lives down in Mexico. But do you know where they took their stand? Their stand happened years before. Their stand was, am I going to live my life for me, for my kingdom, for the American dream? Because here's the deal, they had, you know, Jesse had a great job. They had built a house together. Anyone who's been out to their old house in Town Manchester, it is killer. I don't know how to explain it to you, except I would have moved there if I could and just lived in their basement because it was that sweet. He built his own house. He built it. They had four kids out there. Faith was raising the kids. They had this perfect little environment. A great church family. But it was that moment where he had to decide, am I going to live for something bigger or just live for myself? That's the moment where you take a stand. When you think bigger about who God is and then you respond by saying, I will live for something bigger, the rest of the results, they just kind of happen. And I don't think everyone's going to move to Mexico. I don't think that's the case. Many of you guys, listen, you're going to end up doing incredible things off in your field, maybe as a doctor, as a lawyer, as a stay-at-home mom, or whatever it is that you do. But to live a life that's bigger will come after you make the decision to take a stand on the gospel. How will that play out in your life? I want to say there's a, it, it's important today because we have two people who are coming forward to be baptized. And then when Jesus, when he rose from the dead, he came back to the leaders of the church and said, I want you guys to do two things among men, but two very important things as a group of people. Number one is I want you to do communion or the Lord's table. I want you to break bread and drink together and basically let that be a remembrance of what he did on the cross. We're actually going to do that next week. It's going to be awesome, but you'll get detailed in a second. Another thing he says, I want you to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Why? Because being baptized is a public declaration of something that's already happened inside. There's nothing magical about the water back here. There's nothing magical about the ceremony of baptism. 
But there's something extremely important about the moment of making a public declaration that says, I'm going to live my life for Jesus. When they're standing there and they're in the water and it kind of represents their life, and they kind of live their life for them, and okay, then they make some mistakes, and they realize who Jesus is, and they're like, okay, and they go backwards into the water. That represents they're dying to themselves. They're dying to that way of life, and they're in the water, and that represents the blood of Christ washing them clean, and they're raised up as a new person, a new life. And that life, then, is lived out to follow Jesus. That's a representation of what's already happened inside. And when you stand up here, you're making a public declaration, you're taking a stand, on behalf of who Jesus is. So every time we get to celebrate that, it's an awesome reminder of what's of first importance. So today we have two people that are getting baptized. I'm going to let them come up and introduce themselves and share their story as to what God's doing in their life. Okay? Based on what I look like. Um, 
And I really, that really kind of feels how you look at men in general. Um, and and unfortunately, like I couldn't, I couldn't compartmentalize it, and I started looking for that same validation outside of work. Um, I was surrounded by all these girls who partied and had casual relationships, and it was totally fine. And I think that um, the thought process was, if, if men were going to treat us like we were disposable, then you could just go back, and that's fine. And I did. Um, and then the wake-up call came for me um, the summer before my last year of grad school. Um, I found myself in a situation that I never thought I'd be in. And it like really freaked me out because I think that I still thought of myself as a good person and it's fine because at least I wasn't doing that. Um, and then and then I uh, I did what I thought I'd never do and I was really ashamed and I was I just was caught in this moment where I looked back on how I've been living and who I've been and I was like oh, that's so bad and I really screwed up. Um, I'd always been the person that followed the rules and. and Right, and you know, I was just like, I don't, I don't know how to handle being bad at that something or, or not, not doing things right. Um, so, so in my brain, because I was with the person that got the A's and, and was good at everything, I was like, well, I did that thing, so I should not be punished for that. Um, so I think I was like waiting for like some divine retribution to just come down and be like, hang on, that's the punishment, awesome, and we're done. Um, but that's that's not really how it works. Um, like I was like waiting for like lightning to just be like boom, or I would be like, oh, now I have this horrible disease, but it's okay. So I'm coming for the death as I did, um, and I kept waiting for it. Um, it didn't come, and then uh, it became anxiety and, and, and panic attacks, and, and I would wake up in the morning and come up with something horrible way that I would be punished for the bad things that I did, um, and then I would panic. Function. Um, so, so it got really bad, and I like, couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. I like, struggled through my classes because in grad school they make you sit in my sugar for three hours, and, and that wasn't happening. Um, and, and then I got to the point where I had panic attacks about having panic attacks because I would be afraid to leave my house because, oh my gosh, I went in public and I have panic attacks and freak out. Like, well, better stay inside. But staying inside is also terrible because then there's someone there and you're like, oh, there's nothing to scare you, panic attack. Not really a good cycle there. Um, so, so there was there was one night where it got really really bad, and I, and I had to like I had to call my mom and be like, um, "Hey, what to do? I can't handle my life." Um, and, and she she made me go to the dance, um, and then I I couldn't go to work the next day. And at that point, I was like, "All right, this is legitimately something that I have to get help for." Um, so so I went to counseling at high school, um, and that was. That was uh, good for like a weekend when we had it. Um, but I still had them and like, it wasn't like addressing like the, the issue. Um, and I, I remember at that point I started praying again. Um, that if God would just let me fall asleep, I wouldn't screw up again. Um, I'd be a good person, like whatever we were in. Um, and uh, and then, then on Sunday my, my dad invited me to go to church and I hadn't willingly been in the church since I left my life. Um, but I, I went for, for whatever reason that Sunday. Um, and uh, the pastor was, was preaching on the story of Lazarus. Um, what, what was different about it was he, he wasn't talking about like, when Jesus raised him from the dead, you're here. Um, he emphasized that Jesus waits two days before he goes. Um, and because he waits, a miracle happens. Um, and the, the pastor said that sometimes maybe we feel like God isn't listening. Or that isn't coming, but maybe we're in those two days, um, and there's something good at the end, and I lost it. Like I'm probably gonna do right now. It's fine, because um, I knew that message was for me, and and that it was gonna be okay. Because maybe I was where I was supposed to be, um, and, that, and that Jesus has a better plan at the end. But I couldn't see it at that point, um, and and I I stopped having panic attacks after that. Um, anxiety is still there, but it's, it's something that I've managed now. It doesn't feel like it's out of control all the time anymore. Um, the, that whole time when I've, when I've been really struggling with, with the guilt and how I felt, um, 
my mom might be calling probably like three times a week that I needed to give myself grace. But until that moment in that church, I didn't really understand what grace meant for me. Um, God wasn't going to give me grace because I deserved it. Um, it wasn't something that I could earn. And it wasn't something that I lost because I did all those horrible things. Um, and then when I finally got there, it started to get better. Um, at that point, I was interning as a counselor at high school, and I started having these kids in my office that had anxiety and depression. And I felt that I was better able to help them because of what I've been through. Um, because I experienced it. And, and then at that point, I really wanted to go back to church. Um, but I was like really afraid it would feel the same way that it did before, and that I would feel like I didn't fit it again. Um, and, and, and then Tyler popped up, and, and he invited me to church. And of course, the church was a new life. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs>
Uh, I recently graduated OSU um, in December. I've been at New Life since I started. Uh, and then before that, at New Life now. So, the New Life since freshman year of high school. So, um, like I said, I grew up in church. Um, my family, my family life was always really great. Um, I had wonderful parents who uh, always encouraged me um, to live for God. And my sister, I think we could uh, always talk about things. Um, and so, the first church we went to, we went for 12 years, um, from when I was about five, when I was 14, 13, something like that. Um, and it was, it was a Pentecostal church, so a little crazy. I heard anything about Pentecostals. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, throughout that time, I, I, I distinctly remember the, the first time I ever gave my life to Christ, um, or that she lived, or accepted Jesus in my heart. Um, and I was probably about six or seven. Me and my sister were playing video games, and she mentioned it, so I you know. uh, asked my dad to pray for me. So, you know, uh, for me, that was, you know, that was it. Like, I accepted Jesus in my heart. Um, you know, I read my Bible once in a while, and I prayed it since I was a kid. Um, I didn't really understand what it meant to have a relationship with Christ. Um, and that was, that, that was basically my uh, young years. I never, you know, I never thought about, like, being in a, or being in a relationship with God, you know, actually being, like, loving God. And it was just kind of the, you know, the guy I talked to, accepted my heart, good to go. Um, you know, and around, uh, probably around a little bit after, uh, around 11 or 12, I started um, dealing with lust and pornography. And that was something that just kind of followed me through um, all my teen years. And, um, yeah, it was, it was one of those things, like, I, 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 most of my relationship with God was like, I was living kind of like a double life. Like, on the outside, I was the perfect kid, you know, I, like, I did everything right. I was the guy who, you know, was the good kid. Like, I got grounded maybe once in my life. I hated doing things wrong. Um, but on the other hand, I was, you know, living in sin and not even noticing it. Um, so after we, you know, go through middle school, um, our, the church just kind of fell through. Uh, our pastor left, and so we decided to move to a um, new church. And thank God for my parents, because their main goal was to get me somewhere that, you know, I could grow, um, which I really appreciate. So I ended up in a new life canal, and uh, I think it was those years that I really started to understand what it was to um, have a relationship with Christ. Um, I met awesome people like Jesse Beckett, who's my youth group leader, or David Ensch, also a youth group leader, Chris Snyder, you know, uh, people who, you know, worked in my life and um, definitely showed me what it was like to, you know, actually be in a relationship and love Christ. But um, instead of, you know, going on the I kind of like swung wildly to the other side where I became like self-righteous. You know, I became the guy who knew everything. Like, if you ask me a question on the Bible, I don't know it, you know. I could tell you why this is written where, you know, whatever. And then I just like kind of, you know, I was the good kid. Like, I was the, the leader of the, of the um, you know, among my friends, I was the leader of the Bible study, of the Bible studies that we grew in life. You know, it was definitely a private thing. Like, it felt good to be that guy. Um, and so that kind of, like, followed me all through high school. So when I got to college, I was like, yeah, I'm ready to leave. You know, freshman, freshman college, I'm good to go. Um, and I started to do my OSU, uh, because Chris, once people told me that, or once I told them that I was going to OSU, she was like, I know the perfect church for you guys. So, um, freshman year, I was in David Dunn's Bible study. And, you know, I grew a lot. Um, but there was still that, you know, there was still that part of me that was like holding on and, you know, being very prideful about, um, about my relationship with Christ. That, you know, I was better than most people, or I thought I did. You know, I, I would never say it to anybody, like, I would never actually come up to like, I'm better than you. Know, but in my head, I knew I thought it. Um, and so, you know, um, I slowly became, like, began to realize, you know, so freshman year I didn't do anything wrong. 
like to love somebody else more than myself. Um, and I definitely believe that God, you know, was, you know, was God's timing. Um, if I, you know, if she come into my life any time earlier, then I don't think you know, I would have been able to, you know, I would have been ready. But um, God really started to show me through her just how to love somebody and um, care for somebody other than myself. You know, he's been like working in my heart, being able to um, actually go out of my and not do everything for myself. So, um, you know, for me, I think, you know, I had Ed when talking about um, this battle, like, you know, what God did for me. You know, he mentioned, uh, you know, what was the big thing that God, like, you know, you were pinned out and then God came and saved you from it. Um, so, you know, I didn't really have a big thing. There wasn't one um, big moment that just changed everything, but rather, like, I just kept getting pushed back, you know, war effort, and just thinking I could do it myself. And finally, once I got that, like, you know, once I got pushed far enough, I finally got in. Um, so in the end, God, you know, I think God really just saved me from my own ego and my pride. So, you know, it's, it's definitely a work in progress. It's not something that's just, oh, turn the light switch, I'm good to go. But um, I just thank God that he's put awesome people in my life and um, has helped me to, you know, love others as much as I love myself. <laughs> <laughs>
God went out of his way to explain to you that he really, really loves you. He would do almost anything to get your attention. He would send his own son down to die for you, which blows my mind every time I think about it. And all he wants is for you to simply turn to him. It's called repentance. You simply, you're going one direction, you turn and you go back towards God and say, I'm sorry. I believe in what you did. God, please forgive me. For some people, that pride is what holds them back from turning. That moment when you just think, and I don't need to be that person to come back. I'm okay. I can do it my way. I'm good. At least I'm not that person. Have you ever felt like, like that? That's all pride. The most humbling thing you can do is simply turn back around and say, all right, God, I want to go in your direction. So whether you're like, this is brand new to you, or whether like you've been following God all your life, Every one of us have to have that moment when we turn back to God and offer Him our lives. So that's what I'm going to have us do. Is, uh, we all kind of stand together and pray. And just before uh, Chris leads us out to worship the King, let's pray. Just stand up with me. Maybe just have.